In Luke chapter 8, we have this parable, commonly known as the parable of the sower, which is fine. I understand why we call it that. <clears throat> but the key to the parable is the soil and the types of soil. And uh, I presented to you, well, let's just read it quickly. Let's do that. All right, Lord, I'll read it. Amen. <laughs> and when a great multitude had gathered, I'm in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 4. When a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some of the seed fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. I really want to get to that today. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And what is that class? I taught you last week. It's a Jewish idiom. Say that, Jewish idiom. When Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, he knows we've all got ears. He's not talking about these external clumps of flesh on either side of our head. He's talking really about our spirit's ability to hear in our heart the Word. Because it's our soil, our heart, where the seed goes and penetrates, which Jesus goes on to explain. So, his disciples said, what does this parable mean? And he said to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. That's an incredible principle that I taught on last week that I can't really reteach in its full length today. Here's the explanation. Now the miracle is this. The seed is the word of God. Underline that. Verse 11, the seed is the word of God. I'm so glad we don't have to have theologians try to explain this parable to us. Jesus explains it to us. He, he gives us the meaning. He gives us the understanding. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, but the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The word was sown, but they didn't receive it at all because they let the devil take it, and as a result, they were not even saved. It takes more than just to hear the message of salvation. Come on, somebody. Some folks live their whole life in a church and never, ever get saved. Oh, yeah. You don't believe that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. But the ones in the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. Say root. The key here is root. Who believe for a while, but in time of temptation or trouble or difficulty, they what? Fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they've heard, go out and are choked by three things, cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. That's where I really want to get today in that verse. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word, with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Let's pray one more time. Father, thank you for the privilege to stand before your people, share your holy, incorruptible, living word. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher, not I. I yield myself to you, sir. I ask you to rise up big on the inside of me. Give me utterance, I pray. We'll be sure to give Jesus all the praise and all the glory, for it's in his holy name we pray. And everyone said, if you'll look at your bulletin quickly, I gave you a few of the points that I gave in the message last week. And this is review for those that were here, but for those who weren't, 
we said this. We said your ability to perceive divine truth is related to how much you want to know. Amen. They didn't want to just hear the word. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear is a Jewish idiom that basically means do something with what you hear. You don't just hear it only, you respond to it. Jesus said, you keep my sayings. You understand them and you do them. Your ability to perceive divine truth is related to how much you want to know. Somebody said, you know, a mind is often like a, a what, a, a, a truck with the cement, a cement truck. Our minds are often like a cement truck. All, all mixed up and permanently set. If you're not desiring more, you won't get more. If you just languish in your ignorance and you don't desire truth, guess what? The angels aren't going to bust down your door and visit you in the middle of the night and open the Bible up to you and give you all kinds of revelation. No, Jesus said, he that hungers and thirsts will be filled. So if there's no desire for more, there has to be a, a, a desire to know the knowledge of God. Secondly, I told you if Jesus is not your first love, his word will not be your first concern. And see, these people love to hear Jesus preach, but by and large, they didn't love him. Just listening to a preacher, even if it's Jesus himself, is never enough. We need to hear what he says and then ask, what does it mean to me? And then I also gave you this principle. Everything you need in order to be all that God wants you to be is already given to you at the point of receiving the Word of God. Everything you need. And I'm going to say it again. I said it last week, but it bears repeating. I can say it every single week. The seed is never insufficient. The seed is always all sufficient. If you fail or I fail, it's not because the seed failed. Because the seed, the Word of God, will not and cannot fail. Say amen. The key is the soil. Now, we left off with this principle. And remember, I told you that these particular ones who had the seed fall, but they didn't have roots, the depth of a commitment is determined when people run into the real trials of life. In other words, Jesus is saying that because this one had no deep roots, and as a result tend to fall away when it gets tough. The answer is to dig deeper. Touch your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. It's time to dig deeper. Amen. If your roots are not deep, when the winds of life blow, it can knock you down. The key is the root system. You have to go deeper. Let me say it to you this way. I put it in your bulletin. Salvation is free, but discipleship is expensive, folks. Amen. You can go to heaven for nothing, courtesy of the cross. Praise God. But it costs a lot to get heaven down here to you. God has already given you, free of charge, eternal life. But to get eternal life operating in history <laughs> demands a price tag. What is that price tag? A loving commitment to his word. 
You must be committed to Jesus Christ, and that means you must have roots that run deep. And the only way your roots can run deep is for you to make the proper response to the Word of God. That's what I've called this message, a proper response to the Word of God, to go deeper into the things of God and to take seriously His Word and how to apply it to my life. I give you this one before we move forward. It's the last one in your bulletin. The difference between a victorious Christian and a defeated Christian is real simple. It's that one has allowed the root of the word to go deep into the soil of his or her life. Can you say amen? Others live on the top soil, never putting down deep roots. See, the difference is not that God has favorite kids. He's available to give every Christian the same level of victory. How many know that? He is no respecter of persons. The only way to get deep roots is the knowledge and application of the Word of God. And I can tell you right now, whether you are on your way to deep roots or not, is this one simple little question. I won't ask for a show of hands, but here it is. And here's the question. Is the only time you are in the Bible during this hour or two on Sunday mornings? simple question, isn't it? I didn't ask for hands. I didn't mention your name. But that's the question to ask. Because see, if the only time you spend in the Bible is this one or two hours on Sunday morning, you will never taste a victorious Christian life. Imagine a person eating only on Sunday afternoon meal. I mean, even a big one, even a good one. Because we give it to you good here. Amen. We take very seriously the Word. How many know that? That's why you're here. We take very seriously the Word that's preached behind this pulpit so that it's not a bunch of man sayings and a bunch of little diddly little things. No, it's the Word of God. Handle it. Take it. But if this is the only meal you have all week, you will not be healthy, you will not be strong, you will not be effective. Amen. The same way you'd be weak in the natural, you are spiritually, if this is the only meal you get all week long. It's the same with your spiritual nourishment. If there is no passion to learn and apply the Word of God, no desire to discover what the Word of God says about, about the situations you face, then you will become malnourished, you will be emaciated, and you will be unable to handle the trials when they come. And this, of course, is the difference in Christians. And I got news for you. The trials will come. The enemy will see to it that the temptation and the trial comes. Jesus said so in verse 13. He spoke about them as an accomplished fact. It's not as if spiritual Christians don't get trials and carnal Christians do. If you're a Christian, you get trials, period. Whether you're spiritual or whether you're carnal, they're coming. The issue is whether trials get you. Write this down. Your response to the word determines whether you are victorious or defeated. I think I gave you that. I'm not sure. Your response to the Word determines whether you are victorious or defeated. No Christian has to live a defeated life. That's the good news. That's what I've come to tell you. Yes, you will have problems. Yes, you will have moments of failure. But if you are being whipped day and night, night and day by the world, the flesh, and the devil, then the problem is not the word. The problem is your root system. Amen. Even spiritual ones have moments of great pain. Nobody can deny that. A righteous man falls down, but he gets back up. The devil is there to try to knock us down. But his word will sustain us if my root system is healthy. Amen? Now let me just get to that because I feel like I'm getting out of time already. 
we see here in Luke 8, 14, look at it again. This is the third kind of soil. And this is what I want to really deal with. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked, underline choked, or circle choked. Three things. Worries, cares, it says, riches, and pleasures of this life. Now notice, they bring no fruit, look at this, to maturity. Isn't that interesting? It's not that there is no fruit, because there is the Word in their life, so the Word will produce fruit. In John 15, when Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branches, you cannot do anything without me, but because of the life source through him, his life comes through us, and what? He says, you will bear fruit. And then he talks about coming along and the husbandman pruning the vine so that what? You can bear more fruit. Is verse 14 up there? Yes. What is the, can you give me the amplified real quick? Of Luke 8, 14, please, Denise. Look at this. And as for what fell among the thorns, these are the people who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked and suffocated with the anxieties and cares and riches and pleasures of life. Now notice, and their fruit does not ripen or come to maturity and perfection. Do you see that? That's the key. In other words, picture a tree an apple tree with these little itty bitty little tiny little green apples and the one right next to it has these big beautiful red apples but this tree has these little itsy bitsy apples that aren't red they're green imagine itsy bitsy oranges itsy bitsy pears that's what Jesus is saying. He, he's saying that their fruit doesn't grow to full maturity and full perfection. The group we just looked at barely gets started. They're baby Christians. These folks are more like teenager Christians, we could, if we could put a time frame on it. But their response to the word is still inadequate. We know they've grown some because they have some fruit. But the problem is that their fruit doesn't mature. I remember when I was in my teen years, probably 15, 16 years old, and I wanted my father to start seeing me as an adult. You remember that, you guys? Uh -huh. I remember on my 16th birthday, my dad gave me my first car, a 57 Chevy, beautiful, two-tone Bel Air wagon, it was incredible. Gave it to me on my 16th birthday. Well now, everybody knows that if I got a car like that, I'm a man now. Yeah. And I can still remember, excuse us ladies, uh, every guy understands what I'm saying right now. I, I, I wanted my dad to start, you know, expecting more of me and, 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 and I wanted some adult privileges, especially now that I got a car. Come on, man, you know what I'm thinking here now, right? Yeah, so you get the car, then you get the girls. You understand how that works? Does everybody understand that? Well, you've got no girls, no car. You get a car, you've got girls, man. 
So I'll never forget. I, 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 I try, to, try to tell him, try to remind him, well, Dad, you know I'm almost a man. I know two more years. I mean, I know I'm not 18 yet, but two more years, and that'll be here real quick, and then I'll be a man. So you might as well start letting me be able to practice some of this manly stuff now. And you can imagine how that went over, can't you? Uh-huh. My dad would just simply look at me, and I'll never forget, as only he could do, son, when you start acting like a man, <laughs> then you can do some of the stuff that men do. In my limited mind, I was already there in manhood, but I was nowhere close. And thank God for a father of wisdom who knew better. See, what he was saying was that I was in between the worlds of childhood and adulthood. And I needed to get straight which side of the fence I was on. See, when you're 15, 16, 17, even into 18, you can always fall back into being a kid. But when the day finally comes that there's so much responsibility on you, that you are now a man. And it's not based on years, by the way. But what is it? I want you to see this the way the Lord showed it to me. In that teenage period of time, see, there's two worlds. There's one adult world pulling on you, trying to pull you into the adult world, but there's still your childhood world pulling on you back here to do the things of your childhood. How many can remember that? You got to go back, and I know it's been many, many years ago, but you got to go back and you got to remember that. And I want you to see that there's two worlds here. And see, that's the problem with people that Jesus is describing. Get this. They're producing some fruit, but it's not maturing. It's not ripening. It's not enlarging the way it should. And the reason for this stunted growth, according to Jesus, is that these believers are being what? Choked. What does it mean to be choked? Here's what I believe. Write this down somewhere. What chokes the Christian is mixed up priorities. My God, I could preach this if you'll let me. Mixed up priorities. Because of this, their spiritual lives are entangled in the things that they shouldn't be messing with. What does Jesus say here to the Christian? He says, worries and riches and pleasures of life. Do you know that when you make this world its money, its fun, and its concerns, the engine that drives your life, you are committing spiritual suicide and Jesus says it will choke you. How many of you ever been choked? You ever, you, have you ever had a moment where you couldn't breathe? The panic, the fear, something had blocked your throat. How many of you ever had an experience like that? Or you're, 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 you're struggling to get air? Isn't that a horrifying feeling? Isn't that one of the most <laughs> fearful things that you can think of? I mean, if you've ever been choked, you know there's nothing funny about it. There's nothing funny about not being able to breathe. And see, if you, if you choke long enough and hard enough, you're going to die. Because something has cut off the flow of oxygen that is necessary to give you life. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying this is pretty serious stuff. Because when you allow the concerns of life to take priority over the concerns of the kingdom of God. When you replace your first love with the love for this world, then the Bible says it's like putting a chokehold on yourself and cutting off your very spiritual life, your very spiritual oxygen. 
You won't be able to breathe if the cares of this life are constantly choking you. You will not be able to breathe if the riches of this world are constantly the greatest priority in your life. You will not be able to breathe if these things are prevalent. Jesus said, cares, riches, and pleasures of life is what choke out the Word. Many Christians are cutting off their spiritual life flow. Their lives are crammed full of wrong priorities so that the flow of God's blessing is stopped and blocked. God's power is blocked. God's deliverance is blocked. God's enablement is cut off. Many Christians today are suffocating spiritually. According to Jesus, many Christians are suffocating spiritually. They say, I can't breathe. I'm miserable. I'm depressed. I don't have any joy. Why? Because they are choking themselves. Every time God tries to send some spiritual fresh air through, the flow gets choked off because the believer is too deep into this world, too much into getting rich, too much into having fun. And as a result, God's blessing is choked out. Amen? Say, preacher, that's strong. I know it. I know it is. That's what we need. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with making plans for your kid's education or advancing in your career. I pray that you get promoted on your job. I pray that you, <laughs> you own that place one day. God's not opposed to blessing you. He wants to bless you. But see, there's two worlds that are pulling on you. There's this world over here with worries, but a lot of fun, and all the money. And it's pulling on you to go that way. But then there's this other world, the kingdom of God, that is pulling you. And somehow you're in this, just like a teenager, mixed up priorities. Am I going to go after the money? Am I going to go after the fun? Or am I going to go after God? I want you to know it's okay to make money. It's perfectly biblical to work hard and earn money. I'm going to say that again to the camera over here. It's perfectly biblical to work hard and earn money. And God will help you earn more if he can trust you with it amen but it is absolutely in violation of the word to get to the point where money drives you money should never be number one priority yet that is the number one priority in this world system money is always number one you know it's true you know it's true. There's nothing wrong with wanting to advance yourself. There's nothing wrong with having legitimate concerns. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful. Jesus is not throwing a blanket condemnation over everything enjoyable in life. But here's where the problem comes. The problem comes when you are choked by the concerns of this life. And that is when they become so dominant in your life that they grab you by the throat and cut off your spiritual breath. See, the key phrase here is, look at it again, choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. That's the key. This is the, this is the important part because while we are to live in this life, get it, God doesn't want us to be of this life. Come on, somebody. 
He says, we are to be in this world, but not of this world. Hallelujah. That's the fundamental distinction. And on average, you're going to live in this world for what? 70, 80, 90 years? Maybe a few more, maybe a few less. And for those 70, 80, 90 years, you'll participate in the daily life and routines of this world. But you are not to be of this world for those 70 or 80 or 90 years. How old is Catherine now? She's 98? Get out of here. My God, 98. Don't know how she did it. You are not to let the world set your agenda. You are not to let the world determine your goals. You are not to be driven. Here's the question. Am I driven by the things that drive this world? That's the question. I think I might have given that to you. Write that down. Be honest. You know, as we ever... As we, as we always come out of a year and into a new year, and I'll be preaching an end-of-the-year message as we move out of this year and into a new year. I've already got some things in place for it. But this time is always a time of reflection. Do you do that? I do that every year. As we move out of an old year and into a new year, somewhere around New Year's, I'll just get along with God with a pad of paper in my Bible, and I'll reflect, Lord, help me. What, 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 what can I rejoice over this past year? What can I cry over this past year? What can I do better? What have I learned so that I can do a better job next year than I did last? Does anybody ever do that and sit and reflect? This is a perfect time to ask yourself this question. Am I driven by the things that drive this world? See, here's what I know. You have to choose to be kingdom-driven. If you don't deliberately choose regularly, constantly, daily, I will move in a kingdom agenda and not a world agenda. I got news for you. The world is so strong. The pressure of the tide of this world is so great that it will just, if you're not, if you're not moving against it, it'll just take you in its current. How many know what I'm talking about? And you will find yourself way down river somewhere out of the will of God because you didn't take a stand to say no today. I'm not going to be driven by this world. I'm going to be driven by a kingdom agenda. I'm going to put Matthew 6, in operation in my life. See, many of us Christians, Christians are spending too much time worrying about the Joneses and how can I keep up with the Joneses. I got news for you. You spend your life keeping up with the Joneses You'll never become like Christ because you're spending all your time on the wrong thing. We're spending so much time trying to meet everyone else's expectations that we never get around to being what God wants us to be, what God created me to be, what God designed me to be. We spend our lives trying to copy one another so much, it's like we're a bunch of little clones that look alike, act alike, drive alike, eat alike. God made us uniquely different. Be the best you that God made you to be. Stop being, trying to be somebody else. Be who God made you to be. Be who God designed you to be. Fulfill your purpose, your destiny, your assignment. You're the best you that anybody can be. Amen? And see, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we can spend our entire lives trying to please everybody else. And then Christ will meet us in the kingdom and say, how in the world could you do that to me? I loved you. I gave my life for you. I made every provision for you. But you never got around to my agenda. 
because you were trying to please everyone else. Folks, that is being of this world. That's what I'm talking about. And sometimes it can be so subtle, just like that serpent in the garden, so subtle. Before we know it, it's hooked us. I've talked to people who were so busy making money that they missed the call of God. And the whole while they justified it in their mind. Well, I've got I've to give more. I want to give more. That's wonderful. Everyone should have a desire to give more. Say amen. But if you're not careful, that third and fourth job just so you say you can give more to God and give more to the church. Somewhere along the line, you compromised and you're no good for God now. Just making money. And again, I'm not against money. Can I show you the Bible though, what the Bible says about money? You sure you can handle this? Are you sure? Because these are verses that your favorite prosperity preacher on TV, they never give you these verses. These are the verses in the Bible that are ignored. Turn over there. 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. You know, one wise preacher years and years ago said, there's two things if you want the church to go silent. preach on money or marriage and they'll all get quiet all the saints just get quiet first Timothy 6 I said verse 5 really you could start at verse 1 if you wanted to but if you just back up to verse 3 I said start in verse 5, but go back to verse 3. Let's start in verse 3. Won't take any longer. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Say godliness. He's proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. Boy, I've had my share of that this year. From which come... Excuse me, from which come envy, strife, rivalings, evil suspicions. Now here he gets to it, verse 5. Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, what's your Bible say? King James says, turn away. This translation says, withdraw yourself. I'm New King Jimmy this morning. Forgive me. My other Bible is, is not here. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. There's no U-Haul trailers following your hearse. Amen. You know, they always excavate, you know, these great kings in Egypt or China or some other, you know, nation, you know, of the, of the pagan people years ago. And they're always trying to take all this stuff with them. Like in the other life, they needed all this stuff. They, they, that stuff didn't make it. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we should be what? Now, see, no, no twisted preacher is going to ever tell you that verse. Because he wants you to be motivated by greed and more. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. The rich are tempted more. 
Amen. Just a principle of life. And into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Again, not money, but what? The love of money. That's what Jesus is talking about here. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. You mean greedy Christians? Yes. Greedy Christians. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Now there's a lot here. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. Let me break this down for a few minutes and then find a landing spot. Here are two important tests in this one verse. The first is this. Write this down. Are you having to compromise God's Word to fulfill any of your goals? There's the question. Are you, and only you can answer that. I can't answer that for you. Your spouse can't. Your best friend can't. Are you having to compromise? Say compromise. Are you having to compromise God's Word to fulfill any of your goals? See, if you have to disobey the Bible to get your needs met or get your desires met or get your greed met, if you have to practice questionable ethics and surrender your moral values to get the things you want, if you have to do things that bring disre disrepute to God and His Word, then you're not godly. And you're not gaining anything. If you've got to work two, three jobs, you miss church, you're unable to give your tithes and your offerings, you're unable to serve anywhere in this church, in this ministry, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just working hard and, and asking God to promote you. I'm talking about missing church constantly because you're working somewhere for money. I rarely bring this up, but I might as well right now. So we're ending this year and going into the new year. We'll give an account to God. See, we're stewards in three areas, folks. It's not just money that we're steward over. It's our time, our talent, and our treasure. Amen. And if you use the best of your talents just out in the world, and you never use the best of your talents in kingdom agenda in the house of God, you will give an account of poor stewardship. Your time. Oh boy. That one hurts more than the money. I'm serious. The time is bigger than money. Time is the currency of heaven anyway. Not money. Time. Show me what you do with your time, and I'll tell you what's valuable to you. Show me what you do with your time, and I'll show you who your God is. Amen. If you ever stop and figure it out, okay, God wants a tithe of my money and offerings. Okay, I can do that. I write that check, that's easy. But now look at your time. How much time do you give God? If you came to church, and just coming to church is not the only time you give to God, by the way. It's a good indicator, but it's not the only time. But if what you consider just coming to church is your time you're giving to God, then what is it, two hours a week? Dude, you are in trouble. You are not even close. How many hundreds and thousands of hours do you have every single week? And you make it a big deal because you gave two of them to God and sat in church? Oh, I'm stepping on foots. Oh, I'm stepping on feet all over the place. 
Let me get back to my... Say compromise. See, if you aren't godly, you aren't serving the kingdom. And if you aren't serving the kingdom, then God is against you and you are choking yourself. So the first test is, are you compromising spiritually to accomplish your goals? Let me give you the second one that's right here in this verse. Write this down. It's a question and it's this. Are you content? Say content. Are you content where you are even though where you are is not where you want to be. This one's hard. This one gets right to the core of my spirit. How many want to do better? Every one of us should want to do better. I want to do better. I'm the pastor and I want to do better. We all ought to want to do better. Amen. You may have lofty goals. That's fine. That's wonderful. That's good. But see, godly contentment, get this. Let me help you here. Let me teach you something here. Godly contentment means that your joy, say joy, your joy as a child of God, your peace, say peace, your peace in your heart and your mind, that at inward happiness, they're intact despite your external circumstances. External circumstances can be horrible, but yet you can still have peace inside. You can have joy inside. And the barometer of contentment is that inner contentment on the inside. That doesn't mean God saying, well, just be content being broke and being homeless and living out of a bag and a bike. No, that's not the contentment that he's talking about. He's talking about an inner contentment that no matter, regardless of the circumstances, whether I have much or whether I have little, whether I am sick or whether I am infirm, it will not change my contentment in my heart. Surely you've heard that old, you know, the analogy. You can either be a thermometer Christian or you can be a thermostat Christian what is a thermometer a thermometer will change to whatever temperature is moving and when it gets cold you just get cold with it because you're a thermometer and when it gets hot you just get hot with it because you're a thermometer I'm just going to tell you the way it is we'll be a thermostat a thermostat will set at a certain temperature and change the atmosphere amen and set a barometer of the atmosphere. Instead of the atmosphere changing you, you should change it. That's an inner contentment. No matter what your external circumstances look like, it means you are at rest on the inside. Hallelujah. 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 I'm waiting for God. <laughs> to change much on my outside. But I can still have contentment on the inside and a joy and a peace. Come on, somebody. Knowing that I'm not controlled by my feelings. Some of us are frustrated and irritated and exasperated because things are not the way we want them to be. But see, that's the reaction of Christians who have forgotten that he's their heavenly father that he knows what we have need of even before we ask. He's already promised to meet our needs. See, a Christian who is out of touch with God's word has forgotten that nothing can take God's will away from him. Hallelujah! See, a person, let me wrap this up. A person who is truly content may drive the biggest shiniest Mercedes in town I can hear someone saying well yeah I'd be content too if I had a Mercedes but see that's the whole point right there the point is that if this person loses their Mercedes and they gotta go back to a Volkswagen it's okay because I got a ride either way. Come on, somebody. I got a ride either way. That's contentment. A content person may have a big house, 
But if he loses his job and he has to go back to an apartment, he's okay. He can handle it because he and his family have a roof over their head anyway. My joy is not determined on how big my house is or how new my car is or how much money I've got in my pocket right now. Hallelujah. A person who possesses godly contentment can thank God for the T-bone or thank him for the hot dog. I still got a full belly either way. In fact, let me let you in on a little secret. Sometimes being content, you know what? You'd rather have the hot dog anyway sometimes. <laughs> Glory to God. Your appetites start to change. Your tastes start to change. What pleases you and doesn't please you is loosened from the things of this world farther and farther away. Hallelujah. I'm talking about attitudes that will choke the Word of God. Hallelujah. Can I end with this one? Worry. Worry. People don't realize this, but worrying is a sin. It is as bad as tail bearing. It is as bad as adultery. It is sin. It is blatant disobedience to God he says I am your father you are my child just look at the lilies of the field they neither to sow nor toil yet your father dresses them better than all Solomon ever had who are you to give one care, one anxious, worrisome thought and concern about what you're going to wear tomorrow? Your Father knows what you have need of. Care if you will not, if you will not, listen, you ought to fight worry and anxiety and care like it was the devil itself because it is. My Bible says to roll your cares over on the Lord. And what? And pray with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Here's what I found out about people. Good, right, wrong, ugly, upside down, black or white or good or bad. Here's what I've discovered. There's people that pray and there's people that worry. And never are the people that pray the people that worry. And never are the people that worry, the people that pray. Now you can do one or the other. You can choose, am I going to pray about this or am I going to just worry about this? Because if I'm praying about it, I don't need to worry about it. My God. And I got news for you. If you are worrying constantly about it, all the prayers in the world ain't going to do a thing in the world because you are carrying that care, that anxiety, that anxious thought, and it is like a rope around your neck that is choking you. It is cutting off your very breath in the worst days of trial in my life. When everything was going sideways, everybody I thought loved me was speaking ill of me. I mean, you talk to some people and I'm the Antichrist. And here I am, a sincere, humble man of God. But if you found the right people that hated me enough, they tell you I was the devil. Knowing those lies are going out. Knowing. I can't do anything to defend my reputation or my name. I've got to trust the Lord. Even in those darkest times and nights, you want to know something? I was able to lay my head down on my bed and grab my pillow, and I didn't have to have five shots of this or four capsules of that or a leg massage, butt massage, back massage, foot massage, head massage.
to get me to the place where I was tired. No, no, I just grabbed my pillow. Lord, I'm yours. I'm your servant. I'm going to roll this over on you. I've cried enough about it. I've prayed enough about it. It's in your hands now, God. And find sleep. Amen. Stand to your feet. Did you get anything out of this this morning? I know about you, but I preached myself happy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's lift our hands and let's thank you for this this morning. Well, we thank you that your word is true. Lord, we thank you that your seed is sufficient. And Lord, we receive the word of God this morning. Lord, penetrate, penetrate the rocky soil of our hearts. Give us understanding and help us, Lord. Help us not be choked, choked by, by the things of this world. Now just pray this with me. Say, oh Lord, your word says in Matthew 6, to put you and your kingdom first place. Help me as I end this year and move into a brand new year. Help me with any mixed up priorities that are in my life, in my home, and in my job. Lord, help me move easily toward a kingdom plan and move away from the things that this world would offer me. Jesus, I put you first place. I put your kingdom first place. Now help me, Lord Jesus. Help me love you with all of my heart and be pleasing to you and to fulfill the calling and the purpose and the assignment on my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now let's give him a praise. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise the Lord. As you're dismissed this morning, give somebody a big hug, and I pray you have the most wonderful Christmas season this year that you've ever had before. God bless you. I love you.